um, on parrots or the cytosines, um, obviously, since that's Phoenix Landing's focus, but bear in mind that most, if not all, of these behavior problems can be seen in all of the different bird species, um, both cytosines and the soft-billed birds, passerines as well. Um, so interestingly enough, we started to see more issues as people with a pandemic have taken on um, chickens <laughs> as part of their pandemic solution. Um, so we've actually been addressing some chicken welfare questions too. But today we're going to focus on, on the parrots. So let's go ahead and see if we can get this to advance. That would be helpful. So most pet birds are actually relinquished uh, due to behavior problems. Um, the preponderance of those issues tend to be uh, in some very broad categories. So vocalization is a major one or excessive vocalization aggression directed at uh, people and other birds um, is the other category. So those are our two main buckets. One of the basic things I want you to think about or remember is that the longer they go untreated, the more difficult they become to treat. So just like you and I get better at things that we practice, <laughs> these birds become more entrenched in their behaviors the longer they're allowed to continue. And we don't want them getting better at unwanted behaviors. So these are issues and concerns that shouldn't be allowed to just simply simmer and should be addressed as promptly and quickly and efficiently as possible. Many of these behaviors are a result of learning. So for example, that first bucket or that first category of screaming or excessive vocalization, if the birds learn over time that it benefits them and that they are able to drive some sort of payback from that behavior, it's going to reinforce the behavior and it's gonna become more entrenched and harder to change. So learning plays a key factor, a key role. And other behaviors may well be the result of underlying abnormal neurophysiology. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in depth, but many of these parrots have had um, traumatic or fairly harsh early developmental stages. And those definitely, that kind of background definitely impacts their long-term behavior. So to give a little bit more explanation to the common complaints, the common problems that we see, that's gonna be kind of divvied out into a few um, more specifics. So fears and phobias are fairly common. People have complaints about the birds being scared or worried about specific sounds, sights, um, possibly even set smells. Movement, that fast movement is often something that triggers a fearful response in these birds. Aggression and biting, as we already mentioned, is another big, big bucket category in terms of issues or concerns amongst many bird owners. Destructive behavior, especially as these birds start getting to be bigger in size or get into medium and larger size parrots, they can certainly do a number um, on uh, any kind of environment or object that they come in contact with, including people. Excessive vocalization, we've already touched on. And then there's another category that is of great concern, which is the self-injury or feather picking category. And we do see a fair amount of that behavior in our citizens, unfortunately. Other repetitive behaviors can also occur. And those might be, to give you some examples, things like pacing, or head flipping, those would be classic examples of abnormal repetitive behavior. And then with many of these birds, we see inappropriate sexual behavior. So again, and we'll touch on this in more depth as we get further along in our talk, because of the way they're reared, they may imprint on people, be um, perceiving their owners or their people as sexual partners and direct sexual behaviors towards the, the human in the household resulting in some major issues or concerns. 
And then I also stuck in here, not that it's um, that difficult of a behavior to deal with, it just takes some time and patience, but overeating uh, and or failure to accept uh, an, an appropriate diet. So used to be, we would see a fair number of these birds come in, for example, on just all seed diets uh, or basically be addicted to sunflower seeds. And nutritionally, of course, this is completely inappropriate and inadequate. And the, but then trying to get to shift to a more appropriate diet, it's not a matter of just simply taking away the sunflowers and introducing the new diet. It's actually a very long process in order to do that without causing um, physical harm or physical collapse. So that's often a challenge, uh, especially if you're dealing with rescue birds or birds that um, are um, rehomed, recycled birds. So why do these problems occur? Well, uh, often it's because to be quite honest, we keep these poor animals in environmental conditions that are completely inappropriate and have, do nothing to meet their species specific needs for, for living. So environmental conditions contribute to the mix. Often people get parrots because let's face it, they're gorgeous. That's why I have this, these lorries um, as, a, as an example uh, on, on my slide. Lorries are absolutely breathtakingly beautiful, often referred to as flying jewels with good reason, but because of their diets and their living requirements, they can be very, very messy birds and difficult to house in a typical suburban home. So people get these birds with false expectations or inappropriate expectations, and they are extremely intolerant of normal behaviors in these birds and misconstrue them or find them unacceptable when in fact that's part of the natural repertoire of the, of the animal. Early adverse experience referred to the fact that these birds are often um, weaned early, hand weaned, that kind of thing, and that really impacts their neurologic development. And then bottom line, they are prey species. We are predators. We are pulling these poor animals into our homes and expecting them to be, not only get along, but be happy with um, busy households uh, that contain, for example, kids, um, that contain cats, that contain dogs, uh, that contain a lot of visitors. Um, and all of those things can be very disturbing to these birds and cause quite a bit of stress. I talked about owner expectations. I think uh, if I had a, a couple bucks for every time a client has said to me, um, if I only know uh, now, knew then what I know now, or I had no idea, or no one told me, or they said. So owner expectations are often a problem. Um, wild caught birds versus captive bred. Thankfully, uh, the number of wild caught birds is decreasing due to enforcement, at least in the United States, um, that bans the importation of these birds, at least through legal channels. Um, but interestingly enough, wild birds are more resilient behaviorally than captive bred birds, depending on the way in which they were actually weaned which takes us into the hand weaning versus parent weaning. Wild caught birds obviously would have been parent weaned, whereas a good portion of our captive bred birds are hand weaned. And this adversely affects neurologic development. Um, so the who weaned the bird question, basically when we are looking at behavioral issues or concerns, we wanna know whether they were parent weaned or whether they were weaned by a human. Um, captive breeding programs, uh, thankfully, we're heading more into that in that direction in terms of um, avoiding wild caught animals and in terms of preserving species. Uh, but again, depending on how they're raised, it can impact their neurophysiology. Um, often incubator hatching and hand rearing is the way that, that um, these animals are brought up. So, I keep pounding on the hand weaning. 
Um, early adverse experiences influence their neurodevelopment and later psychopathology. And the reason why that occurs is because um, a lack of exposure to conspecifics to other members of their species causes them to form inappropriate associations and to not have uh, appropriate species identification. I mean, basically, if a young parrot is raised in isolation, it is not able to identify with other members of its species uh, in an appropriate manner. So that separation from clutch mates can be a major problem in terms of their development and later on in terms of their social, excuse me, their sexual development. Social deprivation, um, any kind of social deprivation is a problem and impacts neurophysiological development. Uh, those of you who might have some knowledge about this on the human side, uh, the infamous Romanian orphanages and the impact on children coming out of those orphanages are uh, a harsh lesson in social deprivation and how it affects neurophysiologic development in people. The same basic principles apply with these birds if they are raised in isolation. Um, that inadequate socialization impacts their behavior long-term. And certainly we can't put them on the couch and analyze them, but we have to presume that the loss of security, the loss of a familial unit, the loss of a flax, a flock structure um, influence their influences their development. Uh, we know that maternal separation has consequences. It has consequences on all species, and it has long-term consequences in terms of the animal's ability to cope, in terms of their susceptibility and response to stress, um, in terms of their cognitive function, um, in terms of their actual neural circuitry and in terms of their social competency. So many, many major impacts associated with that maternal separation and deprivation. Um, hand rearing can really uh, cause some problems for these guys. So with that background, let's kind of focus in on uh, fear. I mentioned that these critters are um, prey animals. Consequently, they are often worried or fearful about unfamiliar things in their environment. And if their exposure, if their socialization has been limited, um, they're going to be afraid of a lot of things, a lot of different things um, in their environment, new things, new people, new places, sounds, et cetera. In birds, the way fear is demonstrated um, is through vocalization. So there may be fearful um, vocalizations that they make, defensive postures, often a, a retreating behavior or ducking behavior or flight. It may be uh, as far or as, as, as extensive as avoidance and or escape attempts. And in some situations, the behavior becomes so frantic that they actually injure themselves in their attempts to get away. And then if they can't get away, uh, and if they are cornered, um, the response may then turn into aggression. So there's a reason why it's called the fight or flight response. If they can't get away, then the only option behaviorally um, may well be to resort to aggression in an attempt to alleviate the situation, um, at least from the bird's perspective. So as I mentioned, one of the reasons why these poor guys are so susceptible to this is that they are prey animals and they are, are very worried about anything that has the potential to uh, reach for them, grab for them, uh, consume them, um, and rightfully so. So as owners, handlers, uh, people who interact with birds, we need to recognize fearful postures and respect the bird that is telling us that they don't want to interact or don't want to approach. And if at all possible, avoid those triggers. So avoidance is our, is our friend in this situation. And then we wanna to work towards um, habituation, which means 
getting them used to the situation in a neutral manner. So meaning the bird isn't already fearful. It just means that we're doing slow introductions to make sure the fear doesn't develop. However, if they are already fearful, if they're already showing signs of being worried, then we have to work on desensitization and counter conditioning, which is gradual exposure to whatever it is that they're worried about and um, pairing that with something positive in order to change their emotional response to that circumstance or situation. So again, very important, we want to recognize fear, fearful signs, indication that the, that the bird is worried, avoid those situations if at all possible. If the animal's not worried, but it's a new situation for them, make sure that we go slow so that they can get used to it and habituate and they have a positive experience. But if they're already worried, we want to introduce that situation at a very, very low level at a very, very big distance, some way to keep that animal under threshold and pair it with a positive um, association, usually food or toy, some kind of play in order to change their emotional response to whatever it is that's worrying them. So let's talk about aggression. Remember that was the other big bucket um, in terms of complaints, or I should say um, in terms of concerns that people have to deal with. Um, and territorial aggression is, is talked about natural behaviors and how people's expectations don't always align with what the bird's natural behaviors uh, might be. And so it is natural for these birds to defend their territory, especially if um, they are starting to show any signs of nesting or any signs of um, staking out uh, a territory for in terms of mating purposes. So territorial aggression is very common uh, in our parrot, parrot species. So what do, we, what do we do about it? So it's a natural behavior. I mean, how, how do we deal about it? We, we can't wish it away. Uh, well, one, one way to do that, again, is through management and practicing avoidance to prevent the bird from getting upset and getting triggered. So move the cage away from a high traffic area. Um, prevent um, or keep yourself from reaching in or grabbing or pulling the bird out or other, in other words, keep yourself from um, triggering that aggression. Instead, ask or train the bird to come to you by teaching it a step up cue. Um, start to desensitize it, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and counter condition it to the approach of people to the cage. So people approaching the cage bring good things. They're not reaching for the bird. They're not grabbing the bird. They're not banging its cage. Instead, they're bringing good things to the bird. And then move it into a separate play area um, so that there's a two cage system. And we'll talk about this a little bit more as well but basically um, having a separate area for them to play, stretch their wings, feed, forage, and then a separate area for them to sleep, rest, and have a uh, quiet time. So two, a two cage system often works really, really well uh, for these parrots in terms of management and in terms of um, avoiding some of these behaviors or at least lessening them. <laughs> that would be a better way to put it, mitigating. So another form of aggression that is often misinterpreted is uh, play aggression uh, and or exploration. Uh, birds use their beaks to, as just like we do use our hands um, and people who are unfamiliar with parrots or a little bit worried about the parrot oftentimes uh, misinterpret the, the grabbing behavior or the exploratory behavior of the bird. Um, a common thing that I see happen is uh, people extending their hand towards the parrot. The parrot will reach out with its beak in order to use its beak as a prop to help step up onto the hand. And the person then jerks their hand back, unbalancing the bird, um, so that the next time <laughs> that they offer their hand, the bird 
uh, clamps down tighter in order to keep from getting knocked off its feet or getting unbalanced. And, and that ends up being um, a really ugly downward death spiral in terms of um, the behaviors and the reactions between the two participants. Um, so what do we do about, about this, um, this type of behavior? Well, uh, if, if the bird is starting to chew on you uh, as a chew toy, you want to provide appropriate items for the bird to play with and make sure that they have plenty of different things to choose from. And you want to stop any in, in, inappropriate interactions with the bird. You don't want to play uh, roughly with them with your hands. You don't want to provoke or stimulate uh, grabbing behavior um, because that's inappropriate uh, in most situations. Um, you want this, that to happen. So in order to be fair to the bird so that it's clear hands are not to be chewed on, toys are offered instead. Another category uh, that may occur under uh, aggression, the aggression category is learned aggression. And I refer to that ever so briefly when we were talking about fear or the creation of fear in, in these birds. Uh, basically, there is a fight or flight response um, that they have as prey species. If it gets to the point where they can't escape, no flight, then the next step may well be aggression. And as we can all relate to uh, if a macaw clamps down at, on your hand, as a general rule, you tend to not leave your hand around for them to continue to chomp on, meaning that you withdraw or jerk your hand back. And now the bird has learned that by biting down, um, the scary hand goes away. Um, and, and consequently, the aggression's just been, uh, been reinforced. So what do we do uh, associated with, with learned aggression? Well, respect the bird's desires. It, it's using aggression because it's really unhappy with the situation and it's trying to make the scary thing go away. So avoid unpleasant interactions, set your management up and your, um, your household up in such a way that you don't have to, um, cause any kind of unpleasant situations to occur and use positive reinforcements to teach desired behaviors instead. Um, and also to capture desired behaviors. So it may be, for example, that you've got a bird uh, that lunges every time someone comes near the cage. The first step would be to put the cage in a location where you don't have a lot of traffic so that the lunging behavior isn't triggered. Uh, and then try and do something along the lines of uh, clicking and rewarding calm, quiet behavior whenever the bird offers it associated with an approach to the cage. Another category under aggression is uh, fear and redirected aggression. So an animal might be worried or scared and then because it doesn't quite know what to do with itself, it redirects aggression onto another target. Typically, it's whoever's in the immediate area at the time it becomes frightened. And it could be another bird in the household that's the target of the redirected aggression, or it could be a person in the household that's a target of the redirected aggression. Um, fear is the primary reason for redirected aggression, but it can also be frustration that causes redirected aggression. So, Obviously, as we've talked about with management, you wanna try and avoid triggers, potential triggers for that aggression, um, if at all possible. And uh, once having avoided those triggers, then uh, reward appropriate behavior and or teach alternative behaviors um, as, as needed. And then the final category um, in this, in this general bucket under aggression is mate related and sexually induced aggression. And I had to, <laughs> I had to put a picture of a cockatoo in here uh, because sexually related aggression in cockatoos is, is infamous. Uh, and then on, for icing on the cake, as you may be able to tell from this photo, 
this bird also engages in um, feather plucking or feather destructive uh, behavior as well. Um, and this is actually one of my colleagues, Dr. Colleen Cook, who's um, a veterinary behaviorist in Illinois. In Illinois. Um, and she was kind enough to, to lend me this photo. So let's talk about reproductive behaviors a little bit. What do they look like? So remember, again, we talked about uh, owner's expectations and what's normal uh, for the species that we're talking about and reproductive behaviors, normal <laughs> reproductive behaviors in these parrots include uh, screaming or frequent contact calling, uh, aggression, associated with uh, territory and or mate defense, general intolerance of handling, um, being a little bit edgy and irritable, often with, especially with our um, hand raised or early weaned birds, they may show specific preference for a particular person in the household. They may also indulge in sexual displays, and that includes um, arching of the back, raising the tail, um, quivering of the wings. If any of you haven't seen these behaviors, I was looking on YouTube a little bit earlier just to see what all was out there, and you can do a YouTube search and, and see plenty of sexual displays because it is very common, so easy to get on video. In addition to that, um, part of the mating process in parrots often involves, uh, involves aloe feeding, so the partners feeding each other, so you may get frequent regurgitation. Um, you see panting um, and masturbation, rubbing of the cloaca either against, against a person, um, if they have a favored person or against objects, and then nesting activities. So looking to find um, some place to create a nest and or a shredding of items or objects in order to line that nesting cavity. I <clears throat> still remember uh, very vividly visiting uh, a client uh, on Maryland side of the river in her condo. She was, had several parrots and she was talking about how um, well situated they were in her condo and how relaxed they were and how they had found um, uh, a, a, a little safe place. They had a little <laughs> place that they liked to go um, when they were tired to relax. And anyway, long story short, uh, when we moved the bookcase, we found that they had built a beautiful nesting cavity uh, in the wall of her condo uh, where they ripped out the drywall and lined the entire cavity with all kinds of shredded paper and magazines and the like. It was pretty interesting. I tried to find a photo for you. I know I took some, but unfortunately couldn't find it for you in time for this for this talk, but that was quite, quite the discovery and um, quite a jaw dropper for the owner. So uh, what do we do or how do we deal with reproductive behaviors? Uh, remember, I mentioned to you that these birds often have a favored person. So one of the things that we wanna do is we wanna make sure that all family members participate in care. Um, the favored person at best should have an equal role with other family uh, members. Um, if there are enough people in the family that the work can be spread out, the favored person um, probably should even take a minor role or step out of the rotation entirely in order to uh, spread that out a little bit better. You wanna avoid stimulation uh, and specifically anything below the neck is uh, off limits in terms of stroking, rubbing or petting. So you can do little scratches around the head but you don't want to do repetitive petting down the back or rubbing um, on the breast or um, near the tail head. So you want to avoid stimulation. Um, you want to try to do some desensitization and counter conditioning. Again, what we're, the objective is to have the bird be equally interested in all people in the house and break, if you will, that abnormal attachment to a single individual. Um, and oftentimes, 
the best way to deal with sexual behavior is when the bird starts to display or, so, or show sexual behaviors to ask them to do something else instead. So the reinforcement of an alternative behavior uh, such as stepping up or um, you can teach them different tricks, something to simply interrupt the, uh, the cycle and get their head <laughs> drifting towards the logical side of the brain versus their emotional or sexual side of the brain. And, and uh, also, I, I don't have it on this list, and I should, um, light cycle and diet is extremely important associated with reproductive behaviors. Often, uh, what triggers the beginning of the reproductive cycle is um, the presence of daylight. Um, obviously, most of these birds are tropical birds, live in close proximity to the equator. Uh, where they have a fairly um, evenly distributed day-night cycle, right? A 12-12 cycle. But in our northern climes, at least here in North America, often what will start or trigger sexual behavior is um, increasing daylight um, in these birds. And so controlling the light cycle and having a 12-12 cycle often will help get things down to a dull roar. In addition, one of the things that stimulates sexual behavior is the presence of food. So many of these birds will initiate breeding behavior associated with the rainy season and the blossoming and growth of many fruits, flowers and the like, uh, which is what they forage on. However, in our domesticated home environment, there's a bounty of food uh, at all times, many of them highly caloric. And that high calorie, high availability uh, of nutritional state um, predisposes them to initiating the reproductive cycle. So reviewing the nutrition of your bird, making sure that it is a, a preponderance of um, nice healthy veggies, um, high fiber type things that they can man, you know, play with, manipulate, forage on uh, without increasing their calorie load um, is extremely important in terms of dealing with reproductive behavior. And that being said, having done all of that, some of them may still need hormonal therapy in order to regulate their behavior and or help kind of bump them out of that initial reproductive cycle with the hope of them being able to maintain them with the environmental and management changes that have been put in place. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about normal feeding behavior because it's so important in, in our parrots. Uh, they are opportunistic foragers. They consume all different kinds of seeds, nuts, and fruits. Um, and as, as I mentioned to you, that high energy requirement is associated with reproductive behaviors and also with their foraging behaviors. Some of these species fly literally um, tens and, uh, and, and hundreds of miles in the course of their foraging. And then think about how having them confined to a cage, to, I was going to, to our home, let alone a cage, right? How that impacts their normal behavior certainly limits their normal behavior and certainly skews their calorie requirements. Uh, destructive behavior is certainly a, a common concern. Again, you know, the alignment of owner expectations uh, with the animal that we have in front of us. Uh, they have powerful beaks and they forage for a living and they tear things up in the process of foraging and that is what they do. So rather than viewing it as something that needs to be, you know, and I do air quotes, be fixed or needs to be um, stopped, uh, we need to think about how do we provide alternatives for these guys uh, such that they can engage in their normal behavioral repertoire and we still have a house standing by the time um, they're done. So um, because it's a normal behavior and, and we're the ones who uh, yank them into our homes, we need to provide them with an appropriate 
environment and, and give them alternatives. So giving them forage devices, uh, creating you know, different structures for them to climb and chew on and interact with and play with, all very, very important um, in order for them to, to do what they need to do and be behaviorally and physically healthy. And then of course, supervising them. Um, if you don't want them chewing up your uh, grandmother's antique uh, china cabinet, then you better keep an eye on them and provide them with uh, an appropriate alternative and not go, not turn your back and go chat on your cell phone and come back two hours later and then be shocked and horrified when they um, very efficiently remove the trim off of that Victorian bow front uh, cap. <clears throat> um, excessive vocalization. Um, there are differences in noisiness uh, for sure. Some parrots are louder than others, but as a general rule, uh, most parrots vocalize loudly several times a day for 15 to 20 minutes at a stretch. Um, I was privileged uh, to be in several locations where there were very large, very active um, natural parrot populations. So we spent some time uh, doing photography both in Costa Rica as well as uh, Australia. And as a, as a general rule, these birds uh, tend to go to their roosting areas, uh, flock areas, um, gather together, um, and the early evening before sundown and are very loud and very raucous as they fly into those roosting areas and gather together for mutual grooming and a general, general get together. Um, then they settle down for the night and then again at dawn when with, their, with the arrival of light they then start to become active. And again, there's general hubbub and get together with the, the larger flock, the roosting flock. And then they divide up into smaller groups that go out and forage in the surrounding um, environment. So typically the loudest times tend to occur with the um, arrival of dawn and the arrival of light and in the evening as they're settling down um, with uh, sunset. That being said, uh, vocalization can turn into attention seeking behavior. Uh, remember we talked about how smart these guys are and how um, they may use or <laughs> any of these behaviors if for attention seeking, we learn that it works. And so uh, that is what they do. Um, sure enough, if every time they screech, you come running, uh, they will figure that out fairly quickly and it can become a nightmare uh, if it is a reinforced learned behavior and the owner happens to live in an apartment or a townhouse or condo uh, with neighbors that are not appreciative of the, uh, the screeching that's taking place. They're, they certainly can vocalize associated with fear. Um, there's nothing quite as hair raising as the scream of a terrified parrot. Um, so that may happen as, as well. Um, they may also hiss or click, uh, clack their beak associated with, with fear. Um, they mates contact call to each other uh, in order to keep track of, of, their, of their mate and, and their flock mates as well. And so there, it's a specific uh, call that, that's used to maintain contact with their conspecifics and it might be uh, a sign of um, anxiety or distress on the part of the bird if uh, excessive contact calling is taking place. Uh, you may also get vocalization associated with uh, distress or injury of some sort or you know if there is actually nothing else to do they may call and talk and scream because that's the only way that they have to stimulate themselves. So lack of environmental enrichment may also be a contributor to uh, excessive vocalization. So how do we deal with excessive vocalization? Well, it can be a challenge uh, to meet their needs, but um, we're the ones that have invited, invited them into our homes. And so we need to do our very, very best. 
Um, we want to make sure that we don't reinforce uh, inappropriate vocalization, or excessive vocalization. So one of the things that we want to do is we want to give the bird attention when it's quiet and we want to reward those quiet behaviors, <clears throat> excuse me, whenever possible. When they are noisy, we want to withdraw attention um, so that it is pretty clear that that is not how um, you get um, interactions, that that's not how you get attention. We want to review the environment, make sure <clears throat> that it is appropriate and that the, the bird has adequate enrichment and lots to do other than just sitting around screaming. Excuse me. <clears throat> and uh, we may want to train some alternative behaviors. So if we don't want them to scream, and what, what do we want them to do instead? Um, so for example, I worked with a client <clears throat> with an Amazon, a yellow nape Amazon that was, <laughs> they were living in an apartment and running into issues with screaming. And thankfully the bird um, already <clears throat> uh, had as part of its behavioral repertoire, um, a little slow, a soft pitched whistle that it made. And so instead of focusing so much on the screaming, what we started to do was uh, reinforce that soft whistle as much as possible. Um, and sure enough, well, we were able to um, transfer almost all of our vocalizations over to that soft whistle uh, relatively quickly, um, which was eminently preferable to the screeching and screaming that had been going on um, before. So this is a this is the big the biggie the the one that um, makes us all kind of turn pale um, when we hear about it or thinking about it and that's uh, feather picking or feather destructive behavior um, and as the name implies um, in these situations the birds um, pick or pull feathers out or they may actually chew them off or chew them out. Um, sometimes they pluck them completely, sometimes they shred them, tear them off um, above the point of attachment into the body. Um, so there are many variations on the theme. Different birds exfoliate themselves in different ways. And some birds are so intense with their feather picking that they actually cause soft tissue injury. So they don't just stop with the feather itself, they may actually dig or pick at the skin and cause really uh, dramatic um, cavitating injuries to themselves uh, and some points, in some cases to the point of death. Um, there are many medical causes for uh, feather picking and that is something that always needs to be kept in the back of, of your mind uh, because, um, let's get back to here. And we'll talk about this a little bit more, but we want to make sure that we don't miss anything obvious before we focus on a purely behavioral solution for, for feather picking. Um, there's a lot of thoughts out there as to what feather picking may be caused by. In other words, if it's not um, a medical issue that's causing it, why would the birds engage in this behavior? And one thought is that it is a redirected behavior. So redirected behaviors um, are um, activity um, that is directed towards a particular stimulus, but because they can't interact with that stimulus, they redirect it um, onto something else. And what that means is they, they're usually highly motivated to perform that behavior, but they, they can't do it for some reason. And so there's a, a line of thought or a, um, um, a theory that feather destructive behavior might be uh, a redirected form of foraging behavior. So remember these birds get up in the morning, they divvy up into their foraging groups and they fly out into the countryside. They're out all day long. Remember 12 hours of light, 12 hours a day. So they're out foraging you know, 10, 11 hours. Um, before they come back to their roosting spots. And in our homes, um, they are likely not <laughs> flying out, covering miles, 
um, foraging for 11 hours. So the thought is, is that that's such a highly motivated behavior for these birds that feather destructive behavior could be a redirected form of foraging behavior. The other thought or the other theory is that it is a displacement activity or behavior and a displacement behavior is one that is a normal behavior, but it's shown at an inappropriate time or out of context for the situation. And that's often um, associated with frustration or conflict to some sort. It can be very repetitive. Grooming is a very, very common um, displacement behavior. Those of you who own dogs, um, when your dog is conflicted, you may see it all of a sudden sit down and scratch itself. <laughs> and it doesn't need to scratch right then and there. That is a displacement behavior. That is an indication of frustration or conflict at that point in time. Cats, same thing. They may sit down and start um, just randomly grooming themselves, licking a paw. Uh, and in that situation, it's out of context. It is probably a frustration um, or conflict behavior. And so the thought is, is that um, feather destructive behavior is a, in fact, a, a displaced grooming behavior. And realize that most of these birds, uh, they mutually groom with their partners. And again, in our home environment, uh, they don't have that opportunity most of the time. Commonly affected species with feather destructive dis behavior. Um, it is more common in certain species, and those include, I mean, have a picture of the cockatoo up there, cockatoos, eclectus, conures, uh, African grays, the gray cheeks and monks, and certainly we see it in, in cockatiels as well. And the list is not exclusive. In other words, other species can have this problem too, but um, this list, um, they seem to be more highly and more commonly affected. So as I, as I mentioned, the feather picking is multifactorial. Um, we are fairly certain that developmental influences such as um, early separation from the mother, so maternal deprivation, um, hand rearing, uh, stress associated with incubator raising, uh, environmental issues and the like will contribute to um, the likelihood of feather picking. It could also be a form of separation anxiety. This hasn't been clearly defined in parrots, but it is suspected. Stress plays a role as well with um, high stress environments being more likely to um, have birds that exhibit that kind of behavior. There's also some thought that perhaps feather picking occurs associated with um, uh, sexual behavior that is unfulfilled, reproductive behavior that is actually never comes to fruition and that there's a frustration component associated with it that contributes to the feather picking. In addition, uh, there's some pretty clear indication there's a genetic predisposition or at least a hereditary one. As I mentioned, it is affected by stressors. Um, it's not a learned behavior. In other words, they don't learn it from other birds. Um, and there is definitely a gender predisposition. So females are more likely to engage in feather picking than males. And here's just some examples. Um, the macaw on your left there, you can see he's just picked himself absolutely spotlessly clean. And the African gray on your right, you can see that the little teeny shafts of the feathers um, are still sticking out in most of, um, most of the follicles. So he's sheared them off rather than just simply plucked them out. So what do we do for these, with these guys? Well, as I mentioned, when we first started our discussion, we wanna make sure that there's no underlying medical conditions that are either causing or contributing to the feather picking. So a complete and thorough medical workup needs to be done and any underlying medical abnormalities or issues addressed. Um, and I can give you some examples. In cockatiels, there's some indication, for example, that giardiasis, uh, infection with giardia, 
may predispose those birds to, um, to feather picking. So we wanna make sure that we identify and address any underlying uh, medical conditions. We wanna make sure that the environment is appropriate. So a complete environmental assessment, making sure that all the birds needs are being addressed in terms of foraging, in terms of white cycle, in terms of um, housing, so on and so forth. We engage in behavior modification. So if they're not supposed to be feather picking, what do we want them to do instead and uh, teach them some alternative behaviors that they can be asked to do in order to gently interrupt them and redirect them to an appropriate behavior and then reward them for engaging in the appropriate behavior. Uh, pharmacological therapy may be indicated if there's any chance that the, the uh, bird is suffering from stress and anxiety, then they may need some kind of um, behavioral support in terms of uh, a psychoactive medication. And we use restraint only if needed to prevent serious injury. So our assumption is, is that these birds are doing this behavior because they can't help themselves. And so to physically restrain them, um, you're not doing anything to address the underlying concern. You're, in fact, <laughs> um, it's, it's a real welfare issue for the bird and causing major problems. So we use um, physical barriers simply to prevent self-injury if absolutely necessary. In most situations, something like um, a, um, a sock, a cotton tube sock um, over the bird's body to, to provide a physical barrier or something for it to pick on rather than itself is um, the most appropriate um, way to deal with that if absolutely necessary. Uh, the environmental modifications that we look at include things like air quality, making sure that they have uh, bathing opportunities and that, uh, that there's adequate humidity, um, housing, um, lots of adequate stimulation, varied perches and devices for manipulation, um, foraging devices of all different kinds, and if possible, access uh, to con specifics. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit um, more. Often we don't want um, breeding pairs for obvious reasons, um, but there has some indication in the literature that pairing um, same-sex pairs uh, also work fairly, fairly well. And then as we've alluded to several times already for other issues or problems, a two-cage two system is going to be um, the way to go um, and making sure that they have appropriate photo periods um, in terms of their um, exposure to light and feather growth and molting. What kind of behavior modification? Well, positive reinforcement for appropriate behaviors. We wanna give them food treats or praise or object rewards, um, play, that kind of thing. We want to have set training sessions, so set aside um, a specific amount of time each day to engage in training. Uh, birds will look forward to this as much as um, you or I will. Um, and so I often suggest 10 to 15 minutes at twice a day. This provides mental stimulation for them uh, for sure, and then it teaches them really useful behaviors to have in your toolbox in order to be able to redirect them and help them if need be. Um, and it encourages, a, you know, an appropriate bird caregiver uh, interaction. So not sexual orientation, but in a, um, in a more um, cure response reward type of interaction and helps uh, um, the owners redirect the bird more effectively. If there's something that's stressing the bird or worrying the bird, we would involve, um, would address that with desensitization and counter conditioning. And response substitution just means, again, asking them for a different behavior, an alternative behavior to the feather picking. So gently interrupting them, redirecting them, getting their attention and asking them to do something else. So if we don't want them to feather pick, we can ask them to step up. If we don't want them to feather pick, we can ask them to pay attention to us and to perform a trick. So response substitution. Uh, what about stereotypies? So 
Stereotypes are um, abnormal, unvarying, repetitive, uh, and functionless behaviors that are often seen in barren environments where there's the environment is just absolutely uh, inadequate. They are highly motivated behaviors that are often associated with frustration. And it often occurs when the goal is just not attainable and there's nothing else for the animal to do. So think about um, uh, something that probably everyone's seen at some point or another is pacing of um, animals in a zoo. And commonly these are in animals that cover large distances, have huge territories, and now they're confined in a very small area. So the drive to move and travel is very, very high, but there's nowhere to go. And it is expressed in terms of this unvarying and repetitive behavior. So you see it commonly, for example, in polar bears, you see it commonly, for example, in um, large cats. Um, that pacing type behavior. So it's an effort to cope. And there's some question about whether or not there's some internal reward. In other words, there's that particular species is so motivated to perform that behavior that it is self-rewarding to engage in that stereotypy. It's that important to them. They're not hereditary, they're not learned, there's no gender differences. Um, and they are definitely improved by uh, enrichment and the presence of, of conspecifics. And I'm going to be brave here and try and see if I can show this, um, this video. And if we can't, then we can't. But if we can, that will be lovely. So this is um, of an African gray. See? And this is a stereotypic behavior in the African gray. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, the rocking and the head flipping. We're not seeing a video, Dr. Sin. No, is it not showing? No. Let me see here. Okay. Is that showing now? Not yet. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry about that. I will leave the, the link present um, so that if you're interested, you can certainly go ahead and, and um, check it out. Um, I'm sorry that that didn't, didn't show up the way I hoped it would. Um, so we talked about the, we'll talk about the prevention of stereotypies. How do we go about doing that? Um, I mentioned same-sex pair housing. So these birds actually do very, very well with a compatible companion um, of the same sex or, or the gender. And is something to, to think about. The issue, interestingly enough, that we run into most frequently is that most owners uh, want the bird's attention to, to be on them. And they're not interested necessarily in uh, sharing with, with another bird, um, which is kind of sad. Um, if the birds have no other alternatives, of course they focus their attention on people because that's the only choice that they have. Um, so again, owner expectations versus what's best for the birds. Um, but same-sex pairing often helps substantially. Um, lots of enrichment. Uh, there are all kinds of ideas out there on the, on the internet. So consider uh, checking those out. Um, and what they found is that when these animals do have a, a partner, um, they use the enrichments more. They spent less uh, time screaming and inactive. Um, and that they were less likely to develop stereotypies compared to singly housed birds. Um, they were also less uh, aggressive and uh, fearful associated with handlers. Um, but the downside is that when you pair a bird with another bird, there is the possibility for injuries to occur uh, during scuffles. So that is um, something to think about is that same sex um, 
alloparin. Um, environmental enrichment with birds that had appropriate environmental enrichment, it decreased their fear of novel objects uh, and humans. It increased their motivation to interact with humans and the novel objects. And it prevented and even reversed uh, stereotypies as well as prevented and reduced uh, feather pain. So environmental en en enrichment, it's a no brainer. We wanna make sure we provide that for our birds. Um, this is what we don't want in our captive environments. Um, this is what we're looking for in the environment as much as we can be, to be able to provide that to them. Um, so the environment should provide for expression of their normal species behaviors or typical behaviors. Um, we want to try and accommodate their natural time budget as much as possible by providing them with foraging opportunities, a normal sleep cycle, um, appropriate physical activities such as climbing and grasping, um, if possible even flying, and uh, social interactions either with other birds or uh, with ourselves in an appropriate manner. So uh, that was certainly a whirlwind tour, but hopefully gave you some background information. Um, here are some recap points for you. And basically the takeaway message is the sooner you treat, uh, the better your chances for success whenever you have a behavior issue or concern. Uh, feather picking or any other kind of self injurious behavior once it has begun, may never resolve completely. So remember how much learning plays into our behavior and those of our birds. Um, we want, we can mitigate it, we can manage it, we can redirect them, but we may not be able to eliminate it. And alas, I do not have a magic purple pill. So medication is rarely uh, the solution, certainly not by itself and appropriate environmental, um, providing appropriate environment and enrichment is key to preventing most of the behavior problems that we see uh, in, these, in these parents. Uh, there are some pretty good books out there that I would suggest if you want the Bible in terms of parrot behavior, that would be Dr. Lusher's book called The Manual of Parrot Behavior. Hopefully here before too long, we're gonna have an updated uh, edition of that. Um, we shall see how quickly we manage to get that out there. And then there are a number of really easy to use, uh, very accessible books on clicker training for birds. Uh, these are two that my clients often use and recommend. They seem to feel that they um, do a good job uh, clicker training for birds, which is from the Camp Fire Academy group, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, the click does the trick, uh, the trick by a bush. I have some references here for those of you who are scientifically minded in terms when we're talking about how to prevent um, some of these behavior issues or problems. These are the papers that those recommendations are based on. And then uh, last but not least, I am happy to answer any questions that may have come up uh, in the chat. I see that we've got at least a few. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Sin. Uh, you, you do have definitely some questions if we have some time for that. Um, so we'll just start at the beginning. We have some great questions from Chris Shank at Cockatoo Downs. Um, she agrees with you completely about how important it is to have parent raised um, birds, but how do we encourage that more with, you know, breeders and, and people who are buying un, unweaned babies, et cetera? How can we try to bring that point more clearly yeah. home to them? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the age old, um, age old, age old, you know, statement of education, 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 you know, education. Um, personally, I'm, I'm seeing fewer of them, well, but cool. I know that that varies uh, region by region. And 
um, I tend to forget, right? Because I my I see have my clients, and I, and that that's a different group from what y'all have to deal with associated in, in the rescue, um, where you're getting getting the ones that are having the issues or the problems. So I don't have a, a good a good answer for you on that one, other than we all need to kind of do our part. For example, this webinar, right? To, right. to try and get the word out there and inform people. Um, hopefully, before they 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 buy a bird, um, in order to, for them to put uh, pressure on folks in terms of what is appropriate and what is not. Yeah, most of the birds that come to us are just because they need a their next home. You know, they're the people's lives have changed. They're not any more of a problem than any other bird in captivity. But um, you know, a lot of times people are asking for that unweaned young one because they've been told that's the one they can imprint and you know. And love them. And, and yeah, do what they want. And of course, <laughs> uh, Liz Wilson used to say, everything young is easy, right? It's when they grow up, they become a challenge. So yeah, we, we try when people ask for that to let them know that hand weaned uh, babies are not necessarily better at all. So in fact, sexually mature birds are actually to some extent easier because you know more yeah. of their personality. Um, she also wanted to know about your thoughts on uh, clipping wings and how that can affect behavior. Yeah, it's a great, great question. It's always a, um, I wish I could refer you to specific research that definitively tells us um, what the what the gold standard is, right? Um, but there are a number of people who will tell you that they are relatively certain that clipping wings or clipping feathers um, started a bird on the path of feather and destructive behavior, right? Yeah. So that's something to kind of stick in the back of your mind. Agreed. Uh, I can tell you that as a practitioner, back when I was doing um, a full-scale exotic practice, we used to see a number of birds that had major injuries associated with crashing to the ground because they were so imbalanced associated with feather clipping, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I know a lot of people are very worried about their birds, um, you know, taking flight and losing them that way. But I don't know. I think that in, unless there's some really pressing reason, um, leaving them with their feathers intact is, is the way to go. Um, and I, it, it can influence their behavior. If, it feels, if they feel really vulnerable, um, and tend to make them a little bit more snappish associated with feeling like they're, they're at risk. So I'm, I'm not a fan of clipping if it can be avoided. Yeah, we, we agree with you. A lot of times um, if you don't clip their wings, they don't fly anyway, but they have their full, full feathers. And then there are people who clip the wings and they think it's safe to take them outside without any kind of protection and then off <laughs> they go, you know? So. <laughs> It doesn't make any sense to me either. Um, somebody wanted to know about, uh, but Pionis seem to, at least our experience as well, seem to get more sexy, matey, regurgitating. I mean, are you finding anything specific about Pionis that? Um... Yeah, not per se, for whatever reason, I seem to be blessed with Amazons. <laughs> lots and lots of regurgitating Amazons. Um, so I, I can't say that that species has specifically stuck out in my mind um, as being more or less likely to, to show behaviors. The only thing that I would say that I have observed is that for whatever reason, um, Piona seem to be often um, port, portly. I guess mm -hmm. that's the best way to put it. They seem to really easily put on weight. And remember the, the discussion that we had about how um, that high level of nutrition is often trigger for sexual behavior. So maybe they are the Labradors of the, of, mm. of the parrot world and, and already a little bit prone to e easy keeping. Um, and consequently, if we don't pay really close attention to their, their weights, um, and maybe that's contributing to um, pushing them into the sexual behavior. 
Amazons too, they tend to be those uh, yep. perch potato get chunkier faster than other species. Yeah. Well, yeah, I tell people that when they have, they have breasts, that's not. Yeah. Double. Cleavage is not a good thing. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, speaking of regurgitation, someone wanted to know what is there a way to measure what is frequent? I mean, I guess regurgitation is regurgitation regardless of how much it happens. It's still a mating behavior, but um, if, if it's going to, if they're going to go into some kind of seasonal time, which I think we can expect is a natural thing for a yeah. procreating animal to do, um, where should they be redirected to like another toy or something else at that point? What do you think? I mean, in general, it's, it's not a behavior that we want, right? Because, right. because, because it, that's the end goal. That's not the end goal that we're headed for. Um, so it, I think that it should be viewed as a flag that you need to start taking some steps. Mm -hmm. to reassess the environment, reassess the lighting schedule, make sure that nothing shifted or changed, that the animal's not being provoked or exposed, and ask them to do something else. And what I usually have, have my clients do is just keep a little tick, tick mark, mm -hmm. you know, little tick marks. So this week it happened five times, uh, last week it happened three times, the week before that it didn't happen at all. And so that what you're seeing is a trend, right? Mm -hmm. It's increasing in frequency. And, and that means that we need to get a little bit more motiva motivated about intervening before mm -hmm. it ends up being a crisis. I mean, if we can't take the drive out of them. It's what? part of who they are. So is there some merit to sometimes like giving them a box to, you know, play with toys and be kind of nesty and just get it out of their system. I mean, sometimes do we let it to let them lay a couple eggs and then be over it? I mean, is there any value to any of that? Again, I wish I, I had research that I could, I could point <laughs> you to, to say that you know, one method is better than another. You know, is it better to, you know, be struggling and constantly trying to redirect them and, and shut things down? Or is it better to just kind of let them do their thing sit on the eggs for a couple of weeks and then maybe they're over with. Right. And I don't have a good answer for you on that one. In general, what I end up doing with clients is I tell them, you know, do your best to interrupt and redirect, do your best to distract, do your best to kind of derail things as much as you can. Um, and if, if it's not successful, um, if you think things are escalating, then we can go ahead and, and let them, um, you know, set up the housekeeping um, and see if that will let things quiet down. But mm -hmm. I've had some birds just kind of hover and hunch and stay um, broody literally for, for months. Mm, yeah, uh, at that, at that that's point, dysfunctional. Right, right. But getting it out of their system maybe sometimes is one way to be done with it too, yeah. It's, it's a yes. fine line in captivity to know what the right way to go is. Yeah, right. and you have individuals to think of. Um, what about uh, when one bird picks on another bird, but not itself? Is that, is that, what's that mean? Yeah, you see that. Um, um, often it's on the back of the head or the back of the neck, and that's how you realize that it's not the bird doing it to itself because the bird can't can't reach back there, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what I tell people is they just need to observe the interaction between the birds and make sure that the picking bird is not physically injuring the the recipient bird so the, the recipient bird isn't being bullied isn't being driven off the of perches that there isn't any active aggression um but this make sure that it is it is simply um overactive grooming and that it's not causing physical harm to the second bird if that's the case then I think we all just need to kind of put up with a slightly bald bird if, yeah. if there isn't yeah. anything else going on. Yeah, um, we have some of those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. If it's affecting the welfare of the recipient bird in some way, then that's another story and it has to be addressed. Yeah. And so if there are no medical conditions other than, you know, being in captivity and not having outlets that nature intended, um, do you recommend like the Lupron or Desilorin implant or Medicam or Gabapentin or, you know, all of the above? I mean, yeah, so it depends. Um, but yes, you know, medical medical intervention, if, if indicated, either implant or injection. Um, as you know, one of the issues with those hormones, implant or injection, is that they're not necessarily long lasting, right? Right. Um, so that's a, a source of, of consternation for all of us. Um, and the situation where we might use something um, like gabapentin, we get a lot of these older arthritic, um, obese yeah. Amazon parrots where you kind of wonder if there isn't a pain component associated yeah. with behavior. Definitely. So often we'll try and uh, get a twofer with a gabapentin in the sense that there is some, there is some anti-anxiety activity associated with it. And it also provides some pain relief. Um, and see if we see any benefit with that. Um, and or um, if there's some indication that there's a lot of fear or anxiety, then trying one of the um, psychoactive medications like um, fluoxetine or fluoxetine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes I guess the implant or the Lupron shot can, you know, put a pause in the cycle, but it's not going to so solve the problem long term. No. And yeah. often what it does is it shuts things down or, or cuts things off for that season. Right. Then the next go around. Right. Mm -hmm. I notice uh, a lot of times this time of year, people are turning on their heat, getting ready for winter. And I think birds get confused sometimes. They think, oh, it's spring, it's warm, whatever. The other thing I think is very interesting is Scott Eccles and his research with the CT and all that is discovering a lot of mutilators are relating are related to organ issues. So mm -hmm. probably more medical than just a, the feather destructive behavior, which may be right. more environmental or social. So what are your thoughts on people who just have one bird and the, how that affects their social propensity? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I, I mean, as we just finished talking about, I think they're happier when they've got buddies or partners. I, I really do. Um, yeah. And if it's a, a solo bird or a single bird, that means that it's a responsibility of the person, right? To provide that social, act, social interaction. But then the downfall of that is that you're providing all the social interaction. Right. And birds often then perceive you as the mate. Just a that's caregiver. right. Yeah. And then that starts the whole sexual behavior cascade. Yeah. I agree. I think just being in the same household, not necessarily being, you know, cage mates or mated bonded pairs is a great thing for any bird to have another bird around. Absolutely. So uh, somebody wanted to know if you're available for consults, you know, outside of your regional area. Do you do like phone and Zoom? They can contact yeah, you for that. Okay, great. And then what about uh, when there's feather destructive behavior only at night? What do you think that might mean? Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so... <laughs> The best way that I can I can answer that is to say that I try and go into these. I try to approach these questions without um, any preconceived notions. Mm -hmm. So, regardless of the issue or the problem, I'm try try and get a complete history and yeah, background. it's hard to give a quick <laughs> answer on one one problem. Reason. Yeah, um, but I would wonder a little bit about you know what the living situation is, how the bird's being kept at night, um, whether it's being isolated or there's some kind of a sound event or something going on that might be stressing the bird, mm -hmm. changing the cage, changing location, something like that, that might be triggering a feather destructive behavior. And as I mentioned, 
I'm 99.9% certain that I have about a half a dozen of separation anxiety cases in these birds. And you wonder if it's a solo owner situation or a bonded to the owner situation and, and the bird is being put up for the night, if maybe that's part of the issue or the problem. Yeah, a feeling mm -hmm. isolated to a, a stressful degree at that point. Correct. Exactly. There are several questions on flight, and I just want to say, in general, we're, we're big on uh, supporting flight if it can be done safely in the home yep. without fans and boiling yeah. water and children. Well, please, just ceiling fans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Associated with ceiling fan interaction. So. Yeah. So some people want to know: should they encourage flight, or can their birds still learn to fly? And I, you know. That's all up to the individual person and bird, but yes, 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 and yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that cardiovascular activity is going to be helpful mentally, physically, behavior wise, everything. Yeah. And starting out by getting them to an appropriate weight before you try flying. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Instead of being yeah. little bowling balls with wings, you know? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's how I feel when we look at Amazons in the wild. They're like, it's so hard to do this. I can't go very far. Yeah, they, they all the other birds are like gracefully having a good time. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think some of the other questions. Um, uh, one somebody wanted to know how you feel about birds eating fresh herbs and things like that. I say, well, yay. As as it's not yeah. for birds. I mean, <laughs> yeah, they have a wide variety of foods and mixes, and they should be given as much choice as possible. Choice is actually a um, great stress reducer, as we all know, and has been proven by our recent pandemic experience. <laughs> yeah. People refusing to go back to work without the <laughs> yeah. availability of choice, right? Exactly. I mean, empowerment's the key to almost right. everything, right? And, um, I mean, it might mean a little more food waste, but still, I, I think when a bird has a choice of food it, and feels that empowerment, that's only good for behavior in turn, both yeah. mentally, physically, as well as just that sense of choice. Yeah. Well, we have to thank Dr. Sin. She's agreed that we can record this, so we will be uploading it to hopefully successfully to our YouTube channel and then as a link on our past event recording page. And so it's a fantastic baseline of behavior concepts and behavior uh, solutions. And so I encourage everybody to go back and listen over and over again, especially if you encounter issues with your bird. And then when you need to address more specifically your bird and need help, you know to go to her and you can you know, have that baseline of concepts in your head already so you can make faster progress in a solution. So we can't thank you enough. Is there anything else you'd like to say to get no, no, on the right track? And thank you for, for doing what you do. I, uh, again, uh, to, to your, uh, your first person's question, you know, thank you for, the, for um, putting this out there and getting the education out there. It can only be beneficial. And, and thank to everyone to, gave up their Saturdays uh, to come and hear uh, the talk. I hope, hope you found it worthwhile. Absolutely. Well, keep doing what you're doing. We need you in the animal world uh, to, to forge those better relationships between people and their, the, the animals they live with um, to just bring a better life to, to the birds. That's all it's we can. I, I love what I do. So and I thank you. <laughs> well, you're very good at it. Thanks to everyone for being here. We're very grateful, like she said, for you taking off, taking time today to be with us. And I hope you'll keep learning. Next month, uh, we're going to be talking about feet with Dr. Catherine Bain. So um, I hope you'll join us then and um, in other future events as well. So thanks again, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Sin. You're very welcome.